Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I, I hadn't planned to quite uh, appear in front of you like this, but I had a, a very intimate uh, encounter with a dark staircase, uh, and it's left me with a, a little problem for the next 12 weeks. Uh, but it's tremendous to be here, and I'm just going to put this down before I do anything else. It's very good to be here. I thought what I'd do is just spend 15 minutes or so talking about uh, my book, The Glass Closet, uh, and why I wrote it, uh, and what I learned while I was writing, writing it, uh, and then perhaps uh, open it up to Q&A, which is, is probably much more interesting than anything I can tell you. Uh, I, I wrote this book really for four reasons. The first is... Uh, to talk a bit about myself and for the purpose of almost ensuring that nobody else thought that what I did was, go was a good idea uh, and that they wouldn't repeat uh, what I did. The second was to find some role models, people who'd come out in the corp corporate world good, in a good way or bad way and talk with them and, and show them off to the world as a whole so that people wouldn't necessarily imitate them, but they would learn something from a role model, something they could identify. Thirdly, I made the observation when I was writing this book that uh, there appeared to be, as you went through the S&P 500 and the FTSE 100, uh, you found this remarkable um, uh, result that there were no, apparently, no gay CEOs. Uh, and that seemed to be statistically improbable, but nonetheless, it was uh, an observation. So I decided I'd have to write a letter to all the straight people in the world, and that meant uh, the CEOs about what they might do to work with people who were gay, either in the closet or out of the closet, in order to make life better inside a corporation and make the corporations themselves better. And finally, I wanted to <coughs> start a, a form of movement. I'm, I'm not going to pretend to be a 60s activist. I, I'm a child of the 60s, but, but I'm not an activist. But I observed a, <coughs> a lot of things about uh, being gay. One was it was a minority. And it's normally the case that whatever progress is made with any minority, it always requires constant vigilance to keep it going forward and not slipping backwards. So I thought we'd talk about the movement that way. Let me unwrap those four things uh, very quickly. First, uh, a little bit about me. I, I was at university in the 60s at a time when it was still quite illegal uh, to do anything about being gay. The Wolfenden Report uh, hadn't been made into law until 67. Uh, and besides, I came from a background uh, of uh, having a mother who'd survived uh, Auschwitz. She'd, she'd, uh, she'd managed to survive and live through Auschwitz. And she had a couple of uh, things she kept talking to me about, N not about her experience, but about her learning. Number one was that if you had a secret, you should tell nobody, because the moment you tell somebody, it's no longer a secret, and they'll use it against you. And number two... She's, she kept it saying to me, remember, if you're a member of a minority, when the going gets tough, the majority always punish the minority. So, my conclusion was pretty clear. Illegal, keep a secret, minority, stay in the closet. In fact, don't even think that you're in the closet, just stay quiet. So I did. Uh, my life uh, developed. I eventually developed two lives, uh, almost like a spy, if you will, a, a legend uh, about uh, being um, completely straight and being part of uh, society which was regarded as acceptable at the time. And uh, then a very private and secret life uh, as a gay man. And in my 20s, I found that to be actually quite fun, quite exhilarating. And I persuaded myself that I was learning great skills about how to read danger, read people quickly, uh, dissemble, and it was uh, fun. And as time went on, of course, it was very difficult to keep that secret, partly because I got, I didn't know at the time, uh, I got to be very well known, and I, I couldn't actually go out without anyone noticing, 
who I was. So I decided to minimize my risks, and as it turned out, by really maximizing my risk. I decided I couldn't go out as a gay man. What I could do, of course, was to get someone to come and see me. Uh, and uh, so I went on internet dating site very early, uh, and I found an escort, uh, and that's what I did. I'm not proud of it. Uh, I made a, a relationship apparent relationship with that person, uh, and uh, it, of course, all blew up. Uh, I was on holiday in the West Indies in uh, the end, end of 06, the beginning of 07. I get a phone call to say that your former uh, partner, your former lover, it wasn't a partner, a lover, uh, had sold your story to the Mail on Sunday. And here are 39 questions you had to answer. And I immediately froze. I thought that life was going to finish. It was the end of my uh, pretense uh, about myself. And I thought all sorts of terrible things would happen. So I tried to prevent the publication. And in so doing, I made a second error of judgment. I used the cover story that I had agreed with him about how we met, that we'd be working, working out in Battersea Park rather than on an escort site, uh, and uh, so I did that. Uh, of course, that was in the legal document, so two weeks later I realized I had to reverse it, but I was searching for a super injunction, which in the end all failed by the end of April, and on the 1st of May, I decided quite unilaterally that I had to resign from BP and leave because I would take the company through uh, what I thought was uh, going to be uh, a little media storm. Little was an understatement. It was a very major uh, uh, media storm that I was in the middle of. And I thought to myself, with all that, I'd uh, have no friends, I'd have no business contacts, that I'd probably have to go and escape somewhere. How, how wrong I was. Uh, first of all, people supported me. Uh, when I went onto the street, uh, Stranger stopped me and shook my hand and said, you know, sorry about what happened to you. Uh, and, uh, and I realized, and people wrote letters for the newspaper, I realized very quickly that all my worst fears uh, about being a, a social outcast were completely wrong. And actually what I'd done was completely wrong uh, to stay in the closet. But it was, as they say, it was what it was, uh, and I had to start a, a new life. I didn't want anyone uh, to repeat that set of experiences. My second reason for writing the book was actually then to look for role models, talk to people who'd been in different circumstances. Uh, all people from different parts of the LGBT uh, community. Uh, had they come out well? Had they come out badly? Were they still in the closet? What was remarkable when I was doing all these interviews with a great researcher was how many people were still in the closet and how many young people were still in the closet and how many young people had left university where they were completely out and then joined business or the professions and had gone straight back into the closet. And their reason was that life was very competitive uh, and they felt that having their sexuality paraded might get in the way of promotion. They were not confident uh, that the organizations they were in were inclusive uh, and that what sometimes the bosses said was actually meant uh, and that it would just get, uh, it would actually destroy any chance they would have in being part of a team because they'd be rather as weak uh, and uh, altogether not a good thing to do. And the paranoia was remarkable. Uh, almost the sort of paranoia that I remembered I had. I interviewed uh, a young man who uh, first gave his name, and well, I obviously I knew who he was. Uh, and when we read back the interview to him, we identified him as a, a banker in London. And he said, you can't do that. And I said, why not? He said, well, you can't say I'm in London, because they might know who I am. If you think about it, it's a bit uh, extreme. Paranoia taken to a very high level. I make the point because there are plenty of stories like that, plenty of things that people
people still have in their mind because they're not convinced that their workplace is safe uh, for them to be themselves. And so that led to my third point. The question was what to write as almost a letter to straight people about making a workplace safe uh, and inclusive for people to be themselves, have the confidence to be themselves. Obviously, a business case was needed, and I think there are two aspects of the business case that strike me. Number one, I think everybody in this audience must really believe that engaged staff, engaged teams, perform better than those that aren't engaged. And studies show again and again that companies, great companies with really great engagement on these long-term staff surveys always outperform those companies that aren't engaged, don't have any engaged staff, by quite a big factor, by about 2% every year. And that's an enormous outperformance in terms of return. Second business case is, uh, and I may say that engagement seems to correlate entirely with inclusion. You have to have inclusion before you can have engagement. And, and the second is the question of diversity, recruitment, getting the best people together by having a really inclusive environment. So I thought I'd write to the CEOs and, and say uh, several points. First, you obviously have to set the tone from the top. You have to say what you want, and you have to measure what you want, and you can do that with surveys. But rather more importantly, you need to sit with your intermediate managers, and I saw this again and again when I was invited to speak to many of the large corporations of the world, and in my own experience it's true, that as the leader you can ask people to do things, but unless you get with them and reorganize their time allocation, nothing much happens because it's all about time. Uh, and I'm always struck by CEOs who say, my most important asset of my people, and then on analysis of their diary, you should think, therefore, their most important time is spent upon people. And that very rarely is the case. And when you analyze the diaries, I used to find it with mine, I used to say, no, I've got to do better. So it's just a matter of getting people to really participate. I've been to several large organizations who say, my CEO is committed, but nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. We have an LGBT network. It's interesting, uh, but it's neither connected because it doesn't have straight allies on it, and it's not connected to the top because the intermediate managers don't do anything about the instructions from the top or the tone from the top. My final point is about a movement, and then let me stop. It's, it's wonderful to be sitting in London or Birmingham or New York or LA or San Francisco or Paris and saying, uh, we really are very enlightened. We have, we have great uh, statements being made about uh, uh, inclusion of LGBT people in the workforce and really making them feel part of it. We have social change uh, occurring, equality of marriage, for example very important move here in the UK. Uh, and so the situation is, there isn't an issue. Everything's done. Everything's done. Uh, and people are saying the right thing, and there's nothing more to do. That's not the case. The glass is definitely half full. It's not half empty when it comes to these great Western societies. But then there are a lot of other parts of the world. There's still 77 countries where to be gay and doing something about it or to promote being gay uh, is illegal uh, and can, in five or six cases, uh, lead you to the gallows. So it's tough out there, and it's very tough for large companies who work in many different environments in the world. It's very tough indeed if they're not inclusive because then they don't know who's gay and who's straight. But if you do know who's gay, then you need to think how you can get those people, get all gay people to have the same uh, crack at uh, opportunities being posted to these countries uh, as straight people. And that's a, a great thing to do. It's a great thing too, provided you can keep your staff safe, 
to have a safe environment, an inclusive environment in the company, even in very hostile, big environments. Tough to do and very, has to be done very carefully. But I thought it's important to say to CEOs as well, you have a role in this, you can nudge things along. You can't change the law, you can't break the law. In, uh, in parts of the world, what you can do is influence by demonstrating that there are people there in your organization who are, part, who are LGBT people who can participate on an equal basis uh, in, your in, your in your company in different countries. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all I wanted to say by way of introduction. I think I'm pretty well on time. Uh, really, the, the floor is, is yours, I think, to make a comment or ask a question. I'd be delighted to talk with you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yep, question here. Yes. Um, no, I think there's a microphone coming. Hopefully you don't have to shout. Hello, thank you very. Uh, hello, testing. Yep. Thank you very much. Very inspiring. I very much enjoyed your book, and I married thank my you. partner in November. So thank, thank you, you very much for that. Um, and actually, as as obviously a member of the House of Lords, uh, you have an impact on lawmaking. You've made a case to business, and I just wondered how receptive you find the lawmakers in the country to to the to the agenda for gay people. So uh, I participated in the equality of marriage debate, uh, which was an eye opener, frankly. I mean, it went through with a massive majority. Uh, and I remember going through the lobby with uh, uh, some friends of mine who were Catholic. And uh, one of them turned to me and said, I may burn in hell, but I am going to enjoy it. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, so yeah, you know, that was, it was a very important moment. But, but I think what it did during the debate was expose a lot of prejudice, a lot of bigotry, and it was, it, it was sad, it wasn't, uh, it was more to do with an un, uh, quite literally an uneducated approach to difference. You know, people look at different people and then they, they it, it signals caricatures and stereotypes. Uh, and, and a lot of that came out. I think it was good that it came out uh, because, uh, you know, you had to have people say it. And then I think they probably listened to themselves and improved, I would say. There are plenty of issues at the moment still. For example, inclusion, I mean, the, the issue of including women in the workplace at senior level is not a solved problem. It's an issue which has been going on for the almost 50 years I've been in business. And even after 50 years, we've now got to the extraordinary position of, I think, forcing 25% of women on boards of FTSE 100 companies but having, I think, only 6% of management committees being women in those similar companies. So where the real power is, which is at the executive level, is still, so it's not an issue solved. I make that point uh, because people are saying, well, we need to solve these issues, you know. And uh, I've been asking questions about, well, you know, if we're going to have women on boards, women on executive committees, which is what we must do, uh, we should also look to see whether BME people are the same represented, and what about LGBT? And by the time you get to ask the LGBT question, people feel almost overpowered. They say, With the, the agenda's too big, uh, why can't it just look after itself? And that's unacceptable, unacceptable. So I think it's really a much bigger question of not ticking the boxes one by one, but by stepping right back and saying, Corporations are places where you really can create, you really can create an inclusive environment. You really can do that because you can set patterns of behavior, you can put incentives in place, you can talk to people, and it's not as difficult as changing attitudes in an entire uh, nation. It's a smaller subset. So I think that's what we have to concentrate on, is getting corporations to be great ex exemplars of inclusion, inclusion, uh, where people really feel that they can be themselves. And whether that is women and the great work that Sheryl Sandberg's doing on Lean In, or whether it's LGBT, 
it's all the same thing. It's, it's how do you create a great environment for people to feel confident to be themselves. Any more questions? Over there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, an incredibly inspiring talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, Thank you. And I, I mean, it's a question about practical application. So I'm doing a mental check of our leadership team. I'm thinking we've got some great role models there. So I have a clear picture of that. But you mentioned um, middle managers and line managers. And um, could you give an example of what we could be doing in an organisation to, is it conversations, is it um, oh, education, of what kind? If you, could you paint sure. a, a picture briefly? So I think that? some of it's a uh, face-to-face experience. Uh, I tell the story of my book of a woman who came out uh, in a defence contractor in the United States. And when she'd come out, she got her, her straight colleagues together and said, let me explain to you what it felt like. Imagine if you went back to your office, took off your wedding ring, took down all the photographs you had, put them in a drawer, you weren't allowed to talk about your partner, you couldn't talk about the weekends because you couldn't say what you'd done, and when your partner was ill, you couldn't go to the hospital. This was before, well, actually, it's still the case in some parts of the States. You couldn't go to the hospital because you weren't admitted as a partner. Imagine that. Just imagine not being able to be yourself. And, and I think that, that sort of vivid experience makes a difference to human beings. So I think real examples are very important. So role models are critical. And then I think it is, that, as well as the tone from the top, the, the great tone from the top, it's working with managers to say, you know, how are you going to spend your time working on inclusive behaviors? Let's talk about what gets in the way. You know, when I say, right, we're all going to play golf, or we're all going to play seven-a-side football, have I done the right thing? Probably terribly well-meaning and absolutely the wrong thing to do, you know, in, in some parts of companies. So it's a matter of, I think, going through those examples. And I think then also making sure that staff surveys, which are very sophisticated nowadays, have the right questions in, and managers can get reflected back to them whether they're doing anything good in this area or, they're, or they, they don't understand what they're doing. But a lot of it, there's very, I actually think there's very little extreme bigotry left. There's a lot of people who just don't actually, under, they're frightened to understand. You know, I went to, um, I went to a large, well-known corporation. I won't tell you which it is. And uh, I talked to the LGBT network, and they said, the tone's great here, but nothing's happening. I then talked to a big town hall of straight and gay people. Uh, and then I was interviewed uh, for the internal video magazine. And the person who was interviewing me managed to interview me without once using the word gay. And I thought that was a real, it, it, I learned something. And it takes a lot of energy for people to actually just say it the way it is, you know, and say, this is okay, you can talk like this. It's not, we're not back in 1950 or 1850. It's today, and you can talk about people being gay. You can talk about lesbians. You can talk about bisexual people, transgender. You can actually talk about it. And I, it, giving them almost permission to do it is very important. Hi there. Sorry, I'm over here. Uh, listening to your talk um, makes me realize that um, I guess I'm one of the lucky ones because um, being a gay person working in banking in parochial Dublin um, and always being accepted makes me realize how fortunate um, I am. Um, but your talk makes me think about a particular point that I've been grappling with, which is, do you think, about, do you think that companies go about inclusion in the right way? And sometimes do they not create more exclusion by you know, creating LGBT networks or women's networks? I know it irritates a lot of people that you, know, you have to create a separate kind of sub-community. It doesn't feel very integrated. What are your thoughts on that? 
Well, I agree with you. I, I think, um, you know, it's a, it's a great first step, I think, to have a, a network. But unless it's connected to the majority, it just becomes a minority sort of ghetto, really. So it's got to be connected to the majority. So great LGBT networks have straight allies on them. They also have connection to the top and to the bottom. So I've been to one or two organizations where it's very evident that the LGBT network is more back office than front office. And that's not good. That really is not good. So it's people who don't feel concerned that being too out of the closet might get in the way of their promotion. So I think these networks work if they really are representative of the org and representative of inclusion, not exclusion. Uh, I think they're great to start, uh, but but they need to they need to get on and be connected. Question here. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, understandably, you mentioned um, very quickly your move from the 60s to 2006, and I just wondered how many occasions and what was going through your mind during that period, and whether you ever thought actually in the position that I am, why don't I come out of the closet and, and take that step? I think, uh, here's the advice I give people. I think I was so invested in these two lives uh, that it, it never crossed my mind. And I think you have to come out before you've invested enormous energy into this apparatus. And strangely, I, I was giving a talk at the Hay Literary Festival on this book. And a man got up in the audience, said, I, don't, I didn't work for BP, but I work in the oil and gas industry. And John, we all knew you were gay. Uh, the only question was, we couldn't find anyone to go and tell you that. <laughs> you know, and, and I thought to myself, yep, that's right. You know, people aren't stupid. They aren't dumb. <clears throat> but they're also, people are kind, actually. They're sometimes too kind. You know, they just let people be in their own space. Uh, and uh, so it was clear. I mean, I thought it was a, a wonderful statement. It was clear, but it was not clear to me. Uh, I think I have a red light here. There's a, which there's says a red light, but bad. I mean, if, if there's one more question, why not? Because uh, I think we've all been enjoying. Is there, is there one more question? Should we just take one last one over here? I think one. Oh, is there one over here? I'm sorry. The microphone's on. I'm sorry. I just wanted to ask about BP. Yeah. Following Deepwater Horizon and the implications that's had for BP and recent news of the structural changes, do you feel it's inevitable that BP will be subject to a hostile takeover or merger in the next five years? Uh, it's been a long time since I've been running BP. You know, I mean, I left in 07 before all this happened. Um, but I think this, that companies tend to have big momentum. It's still a very big company. It's smaller than it used to be, but it's still a big company. Uh, and it's still a company of great people. So let's see. It has a purpose. It clearly does have a purpose. Uh, and I very much have confidence in the team. Uh, after all, that team... A lot of them work for me. Uh, they were more junior those days. Uh, but nonetheless, I have great confidence in them that they'll do absolutely the right thing with the company. Let me just say, I think also, if I may on BP, um, they've, they've done a great job on LGBT inclusion. Uh, two of the members of the management community out and gay. Uh, one is the global head of HR, uh, and the other one is the global head of... Uh, supply and trading, which is where actually all the revenue uh, comes into BP. So, uh, and I think they've done pretty well, I would say. I've met lots of people. I had the great privilege. First time I went back to BP, actually, I uh, never approve of former CEOs pretending to be present CEOs. It, when, when you're out, you're out. Uh, so it, I went back... Um, Let's see, I went back after s over seven years for the first time into St. James Square, the, build, the headquarters, uh, and the purpose of going there <coughs> was to give a presentation on the glass closet. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been very kind. Thank you very much for listening to me.